Let's just start drinking. <laughs> Let's just start drinking. It has been that kind of day. So oh. I'm just going to open this guy up. I see a little mom Napa Rose. Yes, Yay! it is a mom. I'm I'm from I'm in the Sparks verse right now. So, but <laughs> I have an invisible bottle of mom Napa Rose. Now I wanted actually to get some proper champagne, but the problem is I sent my husband into the shop and he couldn't find what I wanted, and I didn't really want to waste time trying to get him to figure it out but now here's the problem i can't get the sucker open so that's i'm gonna have to hit pause for a minute no you keep going well no i i, I need something to help me get it open or else i'm gonna be hit in the face with the so uh throw your sparkly scarf over it <laughs> oh yeah maybe oh shit now it's stuck don't choke yourself <laughs> i like that i'm backseat um backseat champers <laughs> <laughs> except it's not champagne of course because it's <laughs> it's not okay. from the champagne region. Not, I'm, I'm gonna have to get like a bottle opener or something that really oh, that, that is. is actually i was worried about that because that happens sometimes with uh with mom i have found you get your bottle won't open like you want it to hold on i'll be right back had myself all worked out now here we go hey there we go that's the sound we want. Yeah. Oh, probably save it for a nice occasion. <laughs> so for those of you who need assistance in learning how to properly pour a sparkling beverage, what you want to do, and I learned this in my time at the University of Iowa catering department, you want to do like three pours. So you do like a first pour, you let the bubbles go down. You do a second pour, you let the bubbles go down. You do a third pour. And wow. Go. And uh, I too worked for U of I Catering along with Mel. Yes. I was a bartender there too. And what I learned is you got to hit the side of the glass to get the bubbles not to go crazy. Oh, that's actually a you new were doing. I mean, me. you were naturally doing it. You were tilting your glass. Oh, well, I've had many years of practice. So. <laughs> So cheers. I have yes. an invisible glass there. All right. I like your Melanie necklace. Super cute. Oh, thank you. This is actually my sparkle. It's it's hard to see, but um, it's my sparkle. And I don't know if you can see, it's got a little, it's lightning got a little bolt. lightning bolt Ooh. a la David Bowie. This is actually from Taddy Divine in London. So nice. if you're in London and you want like a cool personalized necklace you can go there and they'll they'll do it for you on the spot it's uh it's pretty cool so. i think it's a good tie-in to uh this town is big enough for the both of us because mm -hmm. i love after they sing the you know first like big statement lines there's like a pew lightning bolt and pistols pew, pew, pew. <laughs> yes which <laughs> uh i know a little bit about so should we get into it yeah yeah and you know like you you and i said um we're just go we're going in big we're starting with kimono my house and we're sticking to it um, so yes uh this is one. sparks and sparkles uh my name is melanie johnson cave uh i'm here with amy swan swanson um two friends who've been talking about music together since 1991 and we're going to be drinking some sparkling uh drinks and talking about sparks Oh, we didn't talk about what you were drinking. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. Before I tell you, uh, I was a couple few weeks ago. This must have been like I don't know, either before the holidays or right after. We used a like an alcohol delivery service. Okay. Which, you know, which every time I say things like that to my sister Kathy, who lives in a dry county in Arkansas, she's like, "Fuck you." <laughs> Wait till she hears about weed delivery. <laughs> As anyway, so, but, um, you know, when you, when you do that kind of service, they can get like, I don't know, they don't always have what you select. And so sometimes they swap. And so, uh, they swapped my, I think it was some Prosecco Rosé or whatever. And they actually got me the Corbel Brut Rosé. Is it now, actually, Corbel, oh, wow, you've got Rosé too. Wow. But, you know, Corbel, like we kind of poo-poo it as sort of a cheap sparkling wine. And it is, it's very affordable. 
Um, but this is in the method Champenoise or Champenoise and it's California wine and it's actually really pretty darn tasty. So even though it was like a weird mistake and I was kind of annoyed when I first got it as my, the swap out, you know, it's given me a chance to try something new. It's what we call a drinkable, a drinkable sparkling wine. You know, <laughs> yeah. maybe you start with a Veuve and you, you get your way through that. Maybe you do another Veuve and then you move on to the Corbel. Yeah. Now, just to warn you, I haven't eaten dinner yet and I'm really hungry and you just saw me slam that glass. So it's going to be a fun time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, all right. All right. So today we're going to talk about um, the album that Sparks is most famous for, Kimono My House, uh, which I think many people would call the definitive Sparks album. Personally, I would call it the definitive Sparks album of a particular era, but it's certainly the album that they are probably most well known for. And um even now, if you live in the UK, you know, people will absolutely know this town ain't big enough for the both of us, which is the opening track in a way that is not the case here in the United States. Um, I'm really excited to dig into it. Uh, but as I said to Amy, I must admit, you know, the, the preparation that I had was a little bit limited. Um, so I'd love to turn it over to you and, and hear what you have to say to introduce this album. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have we have lives and as much as we love to drink and talk about sparks, sadly, we don't get to do it as much as we would like. So um, Our listeners thought we did, <laughs> that we just lived on Sparks <laughs> Island, drinking champagne and talking about sparks, which actually sounds pretty good. <laughs> it's a sparks cruise. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put that on lists of things that sparks will never, ever do do so like occasionally you'll hear that insert 80s band is going to be doing a cruise and that's great i just can never see <laughs> the boys from sparks ever ever <laughs> agreeing to that i mean they have a song where they literally say well screw the past so the idea of them being on a nostalgia cruise ain't gonna happen but, <laughs> Which but is we're great. gonna nostalgia yeah. Down to 1974. So yeah. And you, you know, you mentioned that it's the quintessential album of this era and uh, uh, not too long ago, Melanie and I watched uh, the, the music gold satire, the walk hard, the Dewey Cox story, which is great. It's got great music, but it's very funny. And it's a very funny, like biopic mockumentary kind of thing. And at one point, one of the characters says, I don't, I don't like Dewey anymore. And the other one goes, well, you're used to early Dewey. This is middle Dewey now. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> exactly. and so yes. I think it's going to come up uh, as we continue to talk more and more about the, the music that we're in early sparks here. And it's such a pivotal, interesting time of music. Uh, you know, this album came out, what, 1974? It came out in 1974. Yes. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this when I was listening to it and there's a long story that I won't bore you guys with, but like, you know, at this point in time, rock and roll, it was maybe what, 30 years old? It really Not even 20, just, just under 20. So, yeah. I mean, if you think of the quote unquote birth of rock and roll as about 1955, yeah, it was not, which if we go back two decades, where does that take us? 1992. No, no, 92. 2002. Holy, holy guacamole. I am old. <laughs> I make that mistake sometimes. But, but the, the reason why I say this is um, because at the, like, you know, I think about the, it's like, it's like the third generation of rock. You know, if we look at decades and ish, ish, it's, you know, the third and a half generation of rock. So when I was listening to this, I kept thinking like, yeah, rock and rolls is in its like late twenties, early thirties. And it's not the let's break all the norms of the sixties. It is, we are making the norms now and we want to extend what we're doing with music to include lots of instrumentation. And, and it's like, you hear some of that really, what we consider like classic rock guitar in it. Oh yeah, totally. Um, totally. And so it's a really, it's, it's a really nice um, moment in time listening to this music, because it does so much, uh, I, I just think about when we listen to it 
it's like, ah, you know, that sounds like a classic rock riff or this sounds like this, it sounds like that. But at the time that was just getting developed. And so right. it, it's, it's really exciting to listen to it with, with those ears. So I really enjoyed that aspect of, of the album from sort of the um, growth of rock and roll and, and that this was really in that wonderful era of Led Zeppelin and those rock bands like which is it's interesting that you mentioned that because if you go back and I I did manage to have a quick look and you look at what was in the charts uh I went and looked at 1973 because they were obviously you know working on this album in 1974 and you know what were some of the albums that were big and one thing that kind of struck me was that in the UK um, you know, your top albums in the, in the top 10, Aladdin Sane was in there, uh, Pink Floyd, uh, w was in there and, um, top albums, I, I might need to check those facts. So, but certainly Aladdin Sane was in there. And when you go and look at things that were in the, the top 10 or, or were in the charts in the UK at that time, you've got Slade, you've got Status Quo. These are real like stadium rockers. And, you know, of course, as, as Amy and I discussed a couple of days ago, this was the big glam moment in, in the UK, which does and did have its admirers in, in the US, but nowhere near the amount of attention to the bands and the clothes and the styles and all of that that the UK did. And of course, Sparks moved from Los Angeles to the UK to record this album. And if you listen to interviews, I don't know if they say this in the Sparks movie documentary, but I have, you know, done some Sparks super fan sleuthing. Um, they have said that they were not fans at all of that sort of like Laurel Canyon sound that was very popular at that time. So, you know, your, your James Taylors, your, your Carly Simons, uh, even Jody Steely Mitchell. Um, would, what was that? Would, would Steely Dan be in that? Group? I'm not sure. I, I'm I know all the sure. Steely Dan fans are like, no, Steely Dan transcends, transcends the, you know, time and space. And also, I just want to go on record as saying that we obviously think Joni Mitchell is a goddess and, you know, she's great. Um, but that whole sound that was coming out of their area, they were much less interested in. And they, you know, in interviews, they have said they were going to see concerts in L.A. from Led Zeppelin. I mean, imagine being at one of those early Zeppelin concerts that had to be amazing. They were big Pink Floyd, early Pink Floyd fans. So um, all of that kind of leftover psychedelia moving into the blues, um, they, they, they seemed much more interesting. And interestingly, if you go and, and listen to their albums before this, I feel like you can really hear some of that experimental influence. They're, they're good records. They're absolutely good records, and we'll probably talk about them at some point. But it they are a lot less, I would say, radio-friendly, with the exception of probably Girls from Germany, which was later released as a single after Kimono My House became a huge hit. Um, I like them. I, I There's a number of songs I like on them, but Kimono My House is, is like just wall-to-wall -wall pop rock bangers. It, it, there's no... There, there's no rest, as Amy said. They're all, it, it, I would say Kimono is a perfect pop rock record. It's it's perfect. I, I don't think it's the Sparks best album, actually, but um, you can't quibble that this album is like top of the game. And what I find interesting about it is that I do think it sounds very much of its time but also timeless in a way. There are songs on there that honestly could have come out yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, as we kind of get into specific songs, there are, it, it, so, so, okay, so here's my take on, on this album. When I was first listening to it, I was first talking to Melly about it. I said, it's like that friend who you dearly love and is so smart and so funny and so energetic, but they're also really exhausting to be with. <laughs> <laughs> to which Melanie quickly said, are you talking about me? Oh my God, is that about me? Is that no, about me? Oh my God. God. You know, it, and the reason why I say that is because 
it, it doesn't have the traditional like a couple fast songs and then a ballad and then a couple another fast song and ballad. It has these moments within the songs, the song construction, where you have these little you know dips in energy and then but they're moments within a song. It's never a sustained. Um, it's never sustained for very long. And so there is this constant like energy in the song. And it, it's one of those albums that I couldn't listen to while I was working. Um, you know, I had certain, I have certain, I, I, I love to listen to Bach counterpoint when I'm working. I feel like I'm, do, 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 work, 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 work. but this album required every time I tried to do it, I found myself stopping and leaning in to listen yeah. to something. And I honestly, yeah, yeah I, I cannot listen to Sparks's background music generally because it's it's too engaging. There's mm -hmm. too much there. There's too much to think about. The I mean, both lyrically and musically. So it's just distracting. If I want, uh, if I want, I do want music while I work, but it's going to have to be music that I've heard a, a hundred million times mm -hmm. since I was four or jazz chill or electronic yeah. chill because because it's it's too distracting it will just pull you right in interestingly edgar wright was talking about using sparks music in his movies and he said that he really couldn't or at least he felt he couldn't and the reason was exactly what we've just talked about that the music itself is so engaging that it will take he felt it would take you out of the story he was trying to tell mm -hmm. um so yeah. and and yeah this this album is is relentless in that regard yeah yeah and um you know when we were listening we were you know of course drinking and listening to sparks music over the holidays right and you made a comment that one of the things you really like about their music and especially this time period is that you like a lot of the breaks in the song. Mm -hmm. and when you first said that, I, I was like, oh, do you mean the bridge of the song? And you're like, I don't know. We're, and we didn't really get into it. But now that I've really listened to each of the songs more closely, I, I think I understand what you're saying. And so I want to challenge, I want to kind of play that conversation back really quickly and see if I, I got it, see if I got what you were saying, which is that Often within, so, so some of the songs sound like a meld of two songs that were kind of jammed together, or maybe three songs that were jammed together. And, you know, a lot of times the first 10 seconds of the song takes you in one direction and then bam, you're, it, it sounds like a totally different song. Yes. And it's, it's so fun and it's so great. And so I wanted to understand a little bit when you made that comment, like, is that what you're talking about? That sort of like they shift really quickly between styles and instrumentation and, you kind of start with one thing and then you go to another. I, I'm not sure. I mean, it's been a while since yeah, we had that fair. conversation. I kind, of, but I kind of sprung that question on you, so sorry. No, it, it's okay. What I will say is another feeling I have about um, Kimono is, and I, once again, this is when I give the disclaimer that, you know, we have not personally treated uh, the artists, <laughs> you know, like we obviously haven't spoken to them and we don't know this for certain, but my feeling is that Ron Mail has a few songwriting things. He always does that, that, is, and, and I, when I listened to those first two albums, I don't think they had developed them yet, but on Kimono, it was like, ah, I got it. This is what I need to do. This is, this is a feeling I have in the songwriting. And so Two of those things are, um, one is this sort of like hypnotic beat, like a hypnotic tone or something that just like really gets you going, which they still do now. And sometimes like they can have a song like Home that that's all they're doing to some extent, uh, not all. That is definitely a gross simplif simplification, but they just make it so much more of a centerpiece. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. The other thing, and we talked about it a little bit, last week when I was talking about, I can't believe that you would fall for all the crap in this song. They will bring some intensity in the melody, but then they'll give you like a little mini break in the song to sort of relieve that tension. And then they, they put you right back in there. And I feel like, I feel like Ron Mill's been doing that since 1974, but I mean, that doesn't mean that every song isn't different. They definitely are. There's no doubt about that, but Certainly when you are an artist and you develop your craft, there are some things that you learn that are fundamentals that you always try and build into what you're doing. And I suspect, 
I'm probably not describing it accurately, but I, I suspect there's some of that going on. And I feel like that does happen in, in some of these songs. Yeah, for sure. It really does. And oh my gosh, I have so many like thoughts running around in my brain, but you know what? I'm going to save those for when we talk about some specific songs, but I definitely want to build on what you were, you were just saying. Um, but earlier, and, and you just said this before when we or even before we decided to make the podcast, you made the comment that like, you know, you think this is the quint, like just a pop rock album. And I would, you know, my take on it is slightly different. I feel like it doesn't Ooh. really become a pop album until you get to talent as an asset. And I have a, a I have hmm. some back, I have some thoughts as to why, which again, we don't need to go into it too much, but that the, to me, the, in some ways, because we also talked about this being a very theatrical album. Oh, yeah, which I feel like all of their albums are quite theatrical. I mean, then they've said that, you know, when Russell talks about singing, he often says, I'm playing a character. Oh, yeah. And I, I think their whole, I mean, look, right now they're doing film stuff and they're super excited about it. I believe they've probably brought that to every single musical project they've worked on. Yeah, yeah, which I love. And like, oh, I have so many like, plot lines for this album and like oh completely the songs and which ones would be duet versus ensemble numbers versus you know big solo pieces versus book numbers oh. anyway um so if anyone wants to back some funding for <laughs> like Broadway <laughs> do box musical for Kimono My House give me a call send um, it our way send it our send, way I got some ideas um so you know, and I think that one of the things that I, I, gosh, I really love is that it's like you've walked into the show late. But wait, hold that thought because before we put the album on, I want to take a look at that album cover. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because this album, I mean, I kind of feel like the experience of Kimono My House starts with the album cover okay so i just wanted to bring it up i i don't know where i found this up. but this album cover first of all from what i understand it has been repeatedly voted at the top of lists for best album covers and it is a great album cover so if you haven't seen it there are two women um who are asian and they have traditional japanese dress on what I think has made this album cover so iconic is the actions of the women, okay? They are not just sitting there passively. They are actively engaging with the whole process of being seen. You've got one who's actually winking and looking right at you. That is a real nice subversion of this sort of like gazing at someone just to be looked at. And interestingly, the the two women on the front, they were members of a Japanese dance troupe. Um, actually, I have their names. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Their names are Michi Hirota and Kuniki, uh, Kuniko Okamura. Um, and they were working for a dance, tr uh, a, a dance troupe called Japan's Red Buddha Theater. Okay, they were in London at the time. On the right, Michi Hirota later went on to do vocals on David Bowie's Scary Monsters album in 1980. And uh, I kind of think because they were dancers, they bring a lot of that physicality to the shoot and you can kind of see that there. So I feel like taking that traditional, what we might think of to Japanese women or even two women on a cover anywhere on any album in the 70s and having them look back at the audience and sort of play with us is why this album cover still is a timeless album cover and not like a gross embarrassment of 1970s ideas you know oh my love <laughs> exactly yes but, um yeah, yeah and it's true and like you're, you make you make a good point like Two things there is there is um energy in the move like you feel like you've caught the mid movement yes and you've caught it the it's just such a great it's such a great picture it's a great picture that catches a moment in time that you feel very engaged in and uh yeah that's that's very cool 
The other thing that is noteworthy about this album cover, and quite brave, I would say, for an al- um, for a, a band that hadn't had a hit record, their name is nowhere to be found on the cover. I mean, there are versions out there. So if you've got like a digital version or something, there are versions that do now have, it says Sparks. But, but the original album cover did not. Uh, Russell was quoted as saying that they thought the image alone would speak loudly enough. And obviously it really does. So I just kind of wanted to start there because like right at the very beginning of even interacting with this album, I feel like you're in for something special. Yeah, for sure. You know, we also talked to you like, yes, this is a pop rock album, but it's it's also that kind of album where you, you know, you could be a, a, you know, a young teen or a teen and you put your headphones, your giant headphones on and your, you know, record on the player and in, you know, in a quiet place or in your room. And I could see just getting completely absorbed in it. And it, on the, on the note of teens, it also has some themes of like dissatisfied suburbia. And this was, if I if I understand correctly, just thinking about the periods of time, you know, this was a period of time that was a generation that was not, I don't know how to say this, like there had been World War One and then the 20s and then depression and then World War Two and then especially in Europe, this terrible austerity in the 50s that led to the mod breakout you know, the 60s culture that was like, we're going to break all these norms. Part of these streets, swing in 60s. Yeah. Rockers. And, and now we have, you know, again, a little more maturity in the music and in, in the cultural um, uh, appropriation of the music. And now we're dealing with things like unhappy teenagers in, in suburbia and, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. And I know some of that started in the 60s, but I, I really like that aspect and they they do that throughout their music this I I love the way that they treat that time period of being a young person and it's they're not it's not painful but you feel the growing pains of being that age a little bit amateur that's uh, amateur hour is 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 completely about that so yeah I feel like well I mean they were young too right? Yeah. They, they were pretty young as well. I, I get the, I mean, so many of their early songs are about girls, you know, getting girls, being with girls, all of that stuff. It reminds me, there's a famous quote by Franz Ferdinand, um, where they said they, they the started their the band. the band, of course, the band, um, also part of the Sparts picture, as we know, but um, they, uh, someone in that band said that they started their band so they could get girls. And I gotta say, I have a feeling that was probably at least a motivation, <laughs> if, not the, if not the motivation, because so many of these songs are about getting girls and specific girls, which of course, you know, would be on your mind if you are like a yeah. 20. Once upon a time, I was pretty boy crazy and obsessed yeah. I mean, some would say it's still kind and, of man but. and I think that the you know I know that you and I have talked about you know just they were so cute at the time and, oh my god but, but yes also this the sexuality was really interesting you know like you, you were saying before it wasn't it wasn't smell my glove sexuality <laughs> <laughs> If, if you don't know what that is, please just watch Final Tap. That's sexist. Sexist. Um, <laughs> What's wrong with being sexy? What's wrong with being sexy? Sexist. Um, and I think to your point, like the, the album cover kind of says it, which is like, we like smart girls who, you know, challenge us. And, but I don't know, like, I just, it, the, you get that, like the little, you know, so sexy nuances that are uh, not always represented in, represented in other rock music and that's really enjoyable even though this album obviously kicked off um a lot of sparks mania in the uk in particular so it was clearly a a great success they still i think were a little bit different from a lot of stuff that was going on at the time and you know it did not crack the top 10 it was it was up there but it was not in the top 10 of albums sold that year um and i would guess 
that is not because of the craftsmanship or quality of this album. It's really about the accessibility, um, which I think it's all pop bangers, but you disagree. And maybe this is when we can start talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just looking at my notes to see like, oh, is there any other, any other insightfulness that I want to say? Um, yeah. I just really want to make, I want to make a show with this. <laughs> See, I just want to do like various performance oh, art and cabaret numbers to specific songs on this album, but that's me. So that does lead me into two, um, two things, which are that there, some of the songs in this, they do kind of have like the story and exposition behind them. And yes, fun, you know, and like the way, so, so now this leads me into one of the reasons why it is a, a high energy album and it's the, the the songs are different than the newer a lot of the newer music so there's like an adage and I think it's true with um like story writing and and playwriting and script writing but and it's definitely something that I heard in songwriting classes and composition classes uh which is that basically you don't have to use all the notes in the scale man <laughs> oh okay but you don't does have to this use every note does it pardon does this yes oh breaking those rules learn those rules and then break them it's impressive and it's very virtuosic like it's a very virtuoso way of making music and um you know this you can go look on the internet there's plenty of writing about like you know mozart had the ability to be right sometimes very simple and elegant music but also other times very virtuosic many many notes and this to me is from that virtuosic virtuoso kind of feel to it because when I listen to the songs almost every note has a syllable song to it meaning that meaning that it's not like I'm singing a song like it's like, I am singing a song and there's a word on every note and I'm singing the song and there's yeah. a word on every note. How um, does Russell remember all those lyrics? That's oh. a big question. My God, he must really have to work at that. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, one of the things you and I talked about, so, so it's a very impressive virtuosic sound. And, um, you know, when you hear it all together, you hear the keyboards and the piano and the drums and the vocal, amazing vocals. Um, you know, the songs do become more than just a song. They kind of make this sound that's hitting you, but you're not always then paying attention to the lyrics. You know, some of the lyrics are really hard to hear and understand. And oh, yeah. So you yes. kind of have to like read along with it. And um, I, you know, you just mentioned that this album wasn't as popular and, you know, obviously this was before karaoke was like a thing, but part of it is you can kind of, there's, I'm a trained singer and I tried to like actually learn to sing a few of these numbers and I had to actually concentrate and work on it. It wasn't a Buddy Holly song that you can pick up and sing within uh, three, you know, hearing it twice. They use a lot of notes. They use a lot of notes in the scale. They use a lot of notes with, you know, arpeggio notes in the chords. And um, there's a lot of text, like you said, how do they remember all the lyrics? It makes it really challenging. And um, I think for me, that's why I argue that it's not as much of a pop album. It's more theatrical. Um, Why not both? Why not both? I mean, I still think it's a, it's a product of that, that glam rock era, which was very theatrical. And so it fit in. And also don't forget that this town ain't big enough for the both of us is hands down their most well-known song like I mean there is no question more people know that particular spark song than any other song (sighs) which Uh is so amazing and uh and and I'm sure what you're saying is true you have the musical background and the technical knowledge that I don't in this case what I would also add to that, though, is that it's kind of a testament to audacity, you know, which I, I, I feel like when you watch the Sparks documentary and then when you really kind of start 
diving into Sparksology if you want to become a super fan like me or whatever. They are very aud aud audacious in terms of like trying yeah. new sounds, yeah. experimenting with new things. I, my guess, of course, I don't know, is that I sus th that's hard for any artist to do. And I have no doubt that it's hard for them to do too. However, because they're brothers, you know, they have for sure a special working relationship that I think is very difficult to get with other collaborators. And of course, you know, many musical groups that are siblings don't have it, but for whatever reason they do, they have some sort of chemistry because you can look at this album and you can talk about the genius of Ron Mills songwriting in it. I mean, this is that doing all of those notes, but you can also look at this album and look at the genius of Russell Mail's singing and performance, because I mean, how does he hit all those notes? And there's lots of different styles of singing. Mm -hmm. There are complicated lyrics. The lyrics to This Town Ain't Big Enough for the Both of Us are very complex. Like, I mean, I've heard that song hundreds of times. I am very, it's, it's very easy for me to remember the lyrics of a song, like very easy, but I don't know all the lyrics to that song because they're just, they're just too complex, you know? Well, I would argue not that the lyrics are complex. I would argue that the way that the lyrics pair with the notes. Okay. It, yeah, sure. How much sure. That you have a syllable per note and there's a lot of notes. That's and where I get hard. that word classic feel. No, don't apologize. This is, you know, I was thinking about this too, like, this we're just sharing like what we hear when we listen to this music right and, listeners you, know, you don't have to really agree with like, anything we're, we're saying. experts we just really yeah. love music and get excited about talking yes. about it we want to share what we eat here and we both hear really different things which is one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about it so um, so let's get into the, should we get into the tracks do you think yeah i do have one i do have one other thing that i was thinking about going into this and and as we talk about that like Stick with me. Okay, we might cut this out of the podcast. I don't know. But last night, uh, Joe and I were watching a clip from Amadeus. And he was asking me about the harpsichord versus the piano. And I was explaining that, you know, the harpsichord was a smaller instrument, and it had a smaller range of notes. But as composers and, and, and players stretch their ability to make sounds and music and notes and make bigger chords and make, you know, more notes <laughs> in their music that the need for the piano started to grow and so that's how the modern day piano as we know it came from the harpsichord it was developed to grow with the music that was being produced and being played I didn't and in some ways if I hark harken back to my comment earlier about you know at this point music was only or rock was only like 25 30 years old it, 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 a very broad statement this town ain't big enough for the both of us it starts off so strong and in some ways I feel like it's almost saying like rock and roll ain't big enough for the both of us like we are in that moment to stretch what rock music will sound like and so that I find that just whoa very dude and I bet you're right too I I bet you are right and that's that audacity to again. It. <laughs> well you can't Russell can you can go YouTube and see Russell karaoke just fine to it many oh, years later and still hitting those freaking notes okay, how well, does he do it how does he fine. do it I could watch Pavarotti sing awesome stuff too but I <laughs> there's a lot to talk about here and I think we're I think we're going to both be exhausted afterwards we're both going to need to hit our fainting couches um, <laughs> how do you uh, think the band felt you know well, I mean well, that was the other thing I was going to say I mean obviously we talk about the you know the to you know Ron Mile and 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 Russell Mile but there is a lot of strong playing and musicianship oh yeah them. this is this is like a group of musicians coming yeah. together and just really gelling for sure yeah and so I definitely that was one of the things I really have enjoyed about listening closely to it was really listening to what the drums were doing at certain points and what the guitar was doing and um so it's just really really well well performed and well made music so yeah i i have visions of this being recorded like you know like when you're working on a project and you know it's good like you know 
you've got something. I, mm -hmm. I bet that's what those sessions were like. They were there and like you could, I think it's even alluded to in the documentary, like, oh, that's a, that's a good one. That's a good one. Like, I bet they were just like jamming in that studio and being like, hey, this is actually pretty good. Oh, wait, this one's good too. And as I said, you know, both um, the Half Nelson Sparks album, which is the first Sparks album, and then um, a Woofer and Tweeter's Clothing, I think it is, mm -hmm. they were not commercially successful at all. So my guess is that um, these guys were really under pressure to get a hit. And I, I contend that if they hadn't had a hit with this, there probably wouldn't be the spark story that there is because getting a hit like uh this town ain't big enough for the both of us which it was a big hit it went to number two in the uk which i'm as i said before i'm actually sure still annoys i'm like i'm sure they're proud of it but i'm also sure they're like but why not number one and i feel like in the documentary when when ron says there's always been the rubettes in our career like that that is like why did they get the number one and uh, again i will say who remembers the Rubettes? Who knows Sugar Baby Love? I do, but many people don't. But they do know this town ain't big enough for the both of us. Anyway, I, I, I suspect that pressure was on. Like, okay, we really, what can we do to make this album a hit? And for me, I, I just want to say this. Because they went to England and they went from America to England, I had that same journey, okay? Not identical to the male brothers, obviously, but I left my hometown of Chicago and then I ended up living in London and it was very exciting. You know, it was very thrilling to be in a new place and to, to have all of these new ideas and meeting new people and seeing new things. And I suspect as well that that just that thrill of the excitement of embracing a new perspective probably was like just a massive creative shot in the arm. And then all of this like really cool music on that, you know, you can go and see T-Rex, you can go and see uh, Pink Floyd, you can go and see David Bowie on the Spiders from Mars tour. That all had to be very inspirational would be my guess. And, and, and it shows in the album. Yeah. So let's talk about this first number cut to a scene pulled maybe from uh i don't know sunset boulevard like in my casting of the song there's someone it could be a male it could be a female wearing a turban some fabulous outfit and you know i don't know it's like the antagonist big number and that's why i feel like this like i said i feel like you come into this album like you come in late to a show because this is the big antagonist like power song that yes. it's the conflict, you know, when you look at, um, I know I just jumped right into it. Like you, <laughs> you look into, right in. um, you know, the dramatic structure and there's exposition and then a conflict and a climax. And then, you know, there's whatever, all kinds of steps in there. And we are at that conflict point in a show, but you kind of miss the exhibition. Like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. It, it is a pretty cool way to start an album, I have to say. Again, I feel like this is a this is a Sparks trademark. They love to start albums with like really powerful opening numbers. Like if you But it's listen, not an opener. I mean, my point is it's not an op it's not a the store is opening. Da, 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 you know, it's not a traditional opening number. Oh, I disagree. I, di I maybe not a traditional opening number, but I think it's it, it, it needs to be there. It's so, it's so powerful. Oh, yeah. And that, that opening, see, I don't, I don't feel like it's, I don't feel like it's coming in late to a show, but I totally get what you're saying to me that, that like kind of slow build that slow sort of instrumental build. It makes me feel like something exciting is going to happen. <laughs> something exciting is going to happen in this song. And then boom, we're, we're into those uh, lyrics suddenly. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, what I hear when I, when you said you it comes in, it starts off almost sounding like, like a who song, like it's got that vamping. Huh. Like yes. I would agree. The noodling, but then it very quickly goes into a, a pretty, 
beautiful melodic phrase, na 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 na, and then it starts getting complicated. <laughs> oh, the beginning is the beginning is complicated though. The beginning <laughs> is complicated. Not I for think. me, but I get it. Well, to me, but I am not an expert. Um, <laughs> Nor am I, my friend. This is just how we hear it. One of the things that is really cool about this song is the gunshot that comes in yeah. at the end of kind of the first stanza when we get to the first chorus. And there is actually a song exploder podcast episode where they talk, they, they really break down this song and um, they talk about how for some reason they had access to the BBC sound studio and they, they were able to put that gunshot in and they weren't sure about it. They weren't sure. They kind of went back and forth and then ultimately did it, which obviously is an iconic move. And if you listen to the 1997 rework on the plagiarism album, which has a very different sound and in a way, I kind of prefer it, but that's a story for another time. The gunshot is still in there, but I, I love how you've got the gunshot and then you've got those really aggressive guitars coming in. It's, it's really nice. Now, also with this song originally, because of course the line, this town ain't big enough for the both of us. is like a classic movie line. They had several of those. That, that was the original idea with the song that they were going to do like several different sort of classic movie lines. But in the end, they decided to just stick with this town ain't big enough for the both of us, which obviously once again, is part of what ties together the song. So that's a little bit what I have to say. What about you? I, I want to break down, just like maybe just break down a few things as we get Do up it. to the, the lightning bolt. What, Cause I hear a lightning bolt and then a pistol or a thunderclap and then a pistol. Okay. Um, so like I said, you, you, you get that, you know, whatever vamping, like who like beginning. And then you get this kind of pretty melodic phrase come in, but then it goes into one of the reasons why I say it's complicated is it goes into what's called an arpeggio. Okay. So we'll talk about what a chord is. I mean, chord is made of multiple markers within the scale that are played at the same notes that are played at the same time that make a certain sound. Well, you can play them at the same time or you can play them separately. You're still within the structure of the chord and the sound of the chord, but you're playing the notes separately. And they do a lot of that in this album and uh, often have like different texts to it, which is why you were saying it's really hard to remember the text because it's also going to these like notes that are moving up and down a chord or a scale. Mm. So it kind of goes into that. And there are two, like we think about the, this town big enough for you, the both of us, but there's another phrase that's repeated throughout the song, which is heartbeat, increasing heartbeat. Yes. Da, 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 da. Well, also, and it made me who's going to leave, but yes. <laughs> well, I'm going to get to that. So you okay. have that, like, like, that's a great line and you feel the tension of the song start to build and they're adding in uh, another, you know, more instruments. And then you get, um, you know, it could have been done so different. It could have been done like where you build and you go, this town ain't big enough for the both of us, you know, but that's not what they do. They go, this town ain't big enough for the both of us. It's, a, it's a, an intense whispered line and it ain't me who's gonna leave. And it's kind of a classic Russell delivery too, because yeah. I do believe he, he definitely tries to get in the character. You can hear it when oh, he yeah. delivers lines and you can hear it in this song. He's kind yeah. of delivering that line in a bit of a snarl, I feel oh, yeah. like. yeah, it's got that like, um, it's called Sprechsinger, this spoken singing uh, quality. And then lightning bolt, thunderclap. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and it really brings you up and like, you know, it would be very easy to try to hit it hard right off the beginning. Like as a, you know, a singer, I want to go with her. I want to be like, and it ain't me who's gonna leave. You know, I want to <laughs> do that, but they don't, they restrain and they don't get that, that point until later in the song. And um, it's, to me, it's part of what makes it really exciting to hear and why I feel it's so theatrical to me. Like, it's great that you said he's playing a character because you can hear that. 
And and it's interesting you say that they could just go big right away, but they don't. And again, this is that sort of like building the tension. We're going to really take you through it. Then we're finally going to give you that release. They they do that a lot in yeah. a lot of their songs. Yeah, and they and they do it by layering and like um, you know, it ain't you know gonna leave. And we've got that thunder, you know, thunderclap and cymbals and pew pew pew, and then. It's also when you first hear like heavy, like a heavy guitar come in, a heavy drums come in and it, it's, it's exciting. I think it's very exciting. It's actually, you know, this is not one of my favorite spark songs. I remember, you know, yeah. I certainly recognize it as a great song and I do like it, but it is not one of my favorites, but I do have a part that I really love, which is, I want to say it's probably like the second, like it's after the gunshot, we've done like a whole other set of lyrics. And then there's like another build, but all of the guitars are really building that. Like, I just love that sort of like increased. I, I can't do it. I can't do it on key, but like the guitars are up. Then the, the drums come in and we get to um, the chorus again. And then we have another break and we go back into Russell's lyrics. Yeah. I wrote about that too, because it's like, um, you have so many things happening right at that moment. Like, okay, we've just come off of dig it dum dig it dum you know, try, drive, 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 drive. And then you hear like a scream and, you know, a howl. And then you hear the guitar really almost go out of control for a second. Yeah. It's a very, very exciting. Uh, it's very powerful and it's very confident too. It's very, we know what we're doing here with this song. Yeah. Whether they felt that they did or not, they certainly faked it. Yeah, and you get more gunshots, you get the heavy guitar licks. And then to your point about the third verse where it really sounds like they're playing together. Mm -hmm. It's a really, it's a song playing together. And that then continues to that last verse. And you're hearing like a block of sound, not just the singer and the melody and not just the drummer playing the drums, but you're hearing it all together as that block of sound. And it's, it sounds like th those two moments to me sound like the first time, the third verse and the fourth verse where they're actually playing the song together. Huh, interesting. And it's exciting. I feel like there was something else I was going to say. Oh, there is something I want to say about this album, and I feel like it belongs in this podcast more. I mean, maybe it would be in the other one. I didn't know this album existed until this summer, really. I mean, I knew... When you watched the movie? When I watched the movie. Obviously, I knew this town and big enough for the both of us. I didn't know any other songs from it. Um as you know since probably november i've been just like going through all the sparks albums to me this album feels like the lost album of my high school years like i i just know if i had discovered this album when i was a teenager i think i would have absolutely i think i would have loved it i mean i can't i can't say for certain i can't go back in time and know maybe Maybe 16 year old Mel be like, I don't know, it's not Motley Crue or who knows. But you, you, so, you know, I've known you since we were 18 and you've always had a real soft spot in your um, musical, your love of music for like 70s rock. Definitely. And, uh, yeah. And, you know, as, as you know, I, I went and saw um, a screening of Velvet Goldmine uh, this past week, which for those of you who don't know, this is Todd Haynes. Uh, movie that is sort of inspired by the David Bowie uh, early 70s stuff and also kind of the glam rock scene um, of the early 1970s in the UK and I when that movie came out in 1997 I just absolutely loved it I mean in some ways it's kind of a silly movie but it looks yeah. great and the soundtrack, the soundtrack is great is fucking awesome the soundtrack what? is oh. amazing and watching it I mean first of all I then subsequently lived in London for a decade I'm married to um someone who's from London and watching it I now have much more understanding and appreciation for that whole moment in British history. I obviously wasn't there, but when you live in a culture, you start to pick up, you know, big pop culture moments that this culture has had before you got there. And so I, I developed an understanding of like how big 
that moment was um, because it was temporarily quite big and um, influential. And to me, that's the other thing about this album is that it very much seems to come out of that time, which I, I sort of alluded to earlier. But I loved a lot of that music when I was younger, Bowie, of course, T-Rex, all that stuff. And so this feels like a missing piece <laughs> to me of like a musical history that I was already enjoying and then I could just like slat it in. And that's something that I like about Sparks. And I really like all eras of Sparks. We're just focusing on the 70s era right now. So it's a good yeah. place to start. Yeah. Oh, well, this is so fun to talk with you. And I'm not going to lie, I'm feeling a little tipsy uh, as the video has shown. I've been knocking back the, it's, the glasses are so small. They just don't hold enough. <laughs> it's like, Andy Mame, would you like an olive? Andy Mame says they take up too much room in the glass. Well, they do. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I feel okay, but I maybe slowed down just a tiny bit so that I wouldn't, you know, so hey, that's fine. And you know, on that note, I'm just going to say we're recording this on January 30th. So thank God most people's dry Januaries are done. Um, if you did dry January, that is great for you. Personally, it's against my beliefs. Um, and I have a functioning liver and kidneys, so I feel like I don't need to do dry January, but but I'm so glad it's over. I'm so the glad last it's over. metabolic panels and my liver is doing just fine. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor said my my liver looks like that of a newborn baby <laughs> well this was really really fun to talk with you about i really enjoyed it and i know we have so much more to talk about too we have so much more to talk about so please make sure to join us uh for our next episode when we will be really getting deep into the actual cuts you know we won't just be sticking with the single we'll be getting into the deep tracks this <laughs> week so so get excited for that i am, I am. Aww, thanks, thanks for me. listening thanks Mel. thanks guys bye I just, I'm talking I just about the that. part where it kind of goes like, dig it in, dig it in, da da da. No, no, no. Uh, maybe, maybe, but like they really have like. <laughs> I know. I'm just